Welcome back to the Dare to Dream podcast. My name is Gregory Russell Benedict, and this podcast is all about inspiring you to embark on the adventure of your life. Today, I'm really excited because I'm joined by a fellow dreamer. I'm sitting down with Sean Kelly. Sean, thank you so much for being here. Oh, no. Thank you for having me here, Gregory. We are going to have such a fun discussion today. There's, we have so much in common. You, myself, Vinny, we're all people who are out here going for our dreams. And when you meet another person who has declared a big dream and actually taken steps to achieve it, there's a special connection that happens. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And I would love to use your story as a jumping off point. If we could touch on your superhero origin story, how did it all begin? That'd be a great place to start. Yeah. So uh, Gregory, thank you for having me. Thanks for creating this space. Thanks for pr doing this podcast and helping so many people that are, you know, dreaming and wanting to live their dreams and inspiring them. Cause that's the path that I've now chosen. This is all pretty new for me. Um, I, I, I basically myself, uh, when I turned 40 years old, I woke up and I realized that I was no closer to my lifelong dream than, than ever. Like I had never taken any steps towards anything. And my, and I, would almost I was almost afraid to admit it to myself because the the dream was so big and so crazy sounding. But I had always wanted my own television show since I was a, a kid. So at my 40th birthday party, I announced to all my friends and family, and I just said, "Hey guys, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna create, sell, and star my own television show, and it's gonna be a worldwide hit." And people were really excited for me. They were like, "Wow, that's amazing!" Like. Uh, what channels are going to be on? I'm like, oh, I don't know yet. And they're like, well, what's it going to be called? And I'm like, I don't have a name. And they're like, well, what's it about? And I'm like, well, I don't know yet, but I'm going to, and they're like, oh, wait a minute, this is a dream. And they just all kind of, kind of laugh. And people are like, all right, good luck with that. And then nine months later, I had created, sold and started my own TV show. I was starring on True TV, where I created a television show called Storage Hunters. It was the very first storage auction show. And uh, I was on there for six seasons and I started on the show. So there I was living my dream. And then after that, uh, the show started airing worldwide in 127 countries, and it became a huge hit in the UK. So a BBC-owned channel called Dave invited me and my wife to move to London, where I filmed another six seasons of the British version. And then after filming six seasons of that, I created a celebrity version in the UK where over 130 British celebrities came on my television show. So here I got to spend all these years on TV living my dream. Dream It was absolutely spectacular. And I'd had, a, um, I'd had experiences before my life where in my career I had reinvented myself. So I knew I had this formula that I had used that worked really well. And as a matter of fact, I had coached a couple other people. I had a I had a young man who came to me when I owned a comedy club in San Diego. And he said, hey, will you watch me do stand-up? Tell me what you think. And then I sat him down afterwards. I'm like, yeah, that your stand-up's not great. I go, but what's your story? Like, I go, you know what? Tell me about your background. So he tells me about how he grew up in Hong Kong, came to America when he was 13, didn't speak any English. He learned to speak English by watching um, uh, Yo MTV raps. I'm like, okay, that explains a lot. I go, dude, that's your story. You talk about that on stage. I'll give you all the stage time you want. Eventually, you could write a book about your life. Eventually, you could do TV, movies, all kinds of stuff. And he did. He's a very famous actor now. His name is Jimmy O. Yang. And Jimmy's been on crazy in the movie Crazy Rich Asian, Asians. He was in uh, Silicon Valley, Space Force. He's been in tons and tons of movies. He has two comedy specials on Amazon. So Jimmy was being interviewed at Google. He was giving a Google talk. And the interviewer said, hey, in your book, Jimmy, there's a there's a chapter called The Godfather. Who's this Sean Kelly character? And uh, he goes, oh, Sean Kelly. He goes, uh, he's a really good friend of mine. He goes, he was my mentor. And he goes, and he he's the one that helped me along and encouraged me. And he's the one that got me into all of this. And he goes, it's important to have a mentor. So after that, I had like tons of strangers just seeking me out and saying, hey, you helped Jimmy Yoyang. Can you help me? You know, what's this formula you taught him? And uh, and then I started helping a couple people here and there. And then it made me realize, oh, I got to do something a little bit more formal. So just recently, I launched a little website, uh, do the big dream.com, which really just kind of leads to my Facebook group where I'm trying to bring people in and coach them on the same way that I did with Jimmy and the same way I went after my own dream. And what's really cool about all this is that I started from really humble beginnings. Like I, um, 
I grew up in Germany. My parents moved me to Germany when I was 10 years old, and we were living there as illegal aliens. And at 16, my parents both, they split up and they took off. I got abandoned in Germany. So here I am, a illegal alien living in a foreign country. I got abandoned by my parents. But I ended up just getting an apartment, driving a forklift at night, and I finished high school on my own. But I never attended college. I served over in Iraq in Desert Storm in combat. So I had pretty much a rough go when I was younger. But it has led to an amazing life, and um, and a lot of the the a lot of that is to do with a lot of the inspirational books that I've read, and a lot of the self help books, and a lot of the sales trainers that I've listened to, uh, and all of that kind of like sinks into your brain, and then you start testing different things out, and then you realize, wow, the most powerful thing that we have is right here in our minds, and if you can. If you can see it and dream it and believe it, and if you're willing to take action and be bold, there's no stopping you, you know? So anyway, it's fun. It's exciting. And I'm, I'm really and I'm really happy that you, uh, Gregory, that you're doing this podcast and that you're inspiring people to do exactly what it is I'm passionate about as well. To me, there is no greater purpose in life than to go after that dream, that thing that you have deep inside of you that is scary. It's exciting. It's mm this knowing that you could become this person, you could do this thing, but it's really scary in the beginning. And I would love to go back to that moment. It's your 40th birthday and you're yeah. telling your friends and your family, I want to create star film. I don't know the words you said, but basically create your own TV show. Yes. And you didn't know the name. You didn't know what TV channel it was going to be on. You didn't know anything yet, but you knew you wanted to do it. How did you get past that phase because so many people get stuck. They have a dream, they tell it to someone else, the other person asks questions and they don't know the answers. So they kind of put that dream back on the shelf. How did you get past that? Well, okay. So I, I feel like there's like some, I had like the perfect storm of some skills that I'd learned from my other careers. Right. So I, so I, at one point I became a charity fundraising auctioneer, raising money for nonprofits. So I was really, really good at raising money as an auctioneer. Prior to that, I had worked in advertising sales, um, but I have a really extensive sales background working in sales. And there were, there were skills that I learned that helped me become very successful in sales. One is like, I have like this I had this lesson that I learned at a very young age about how to, how to overcome the fear of rejection. I, and it's something that's carried forward with me that, so that re, re, the fear of rejection is not even something that I, I, matter of fact, I consider this one of my superpowers is that I have no fear of rejection, you know, mm. and it's because of this, because of the awesome lesson I learned when I was younger. And then I also learned, uh, I had a, ch a chance encountering once when I was, uh, when I was 15 with, uh, with an Olympic gold medalist who just gave me like like five or six minutes worth of coaching going up the chairlift over in Switzerland. And just the things he said to me resonated in my brain and made me, it made me realize that, um, that basically, basically what he told me is uh, he had, he'd won a gold medal uh, in downhill slalom. He, they used to call him, um, uh, let's see, I, I, it's, it'll come to me because he had like a really funny name. It was almost like a cowboy, right? Like a cowboy name. But this guy won uh, the Olympic gold medal, and uh, and he and I had a chance encountering. And he basically told me, he's like, "Hey, how many how many races have you won?" Because he thought I was a racer because he'd watched me on the slopes. And I go, "Oh no, I I've never won any races." And he goes, "Why? Why not?" You know. And so I started giving him all these excuses why I couldn't win these races. And he came back and he goes, whoa, 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 just stop, stop with all that. He goes, get on the chairlift. He goes, I want to tell you something. He goes, listen, man. He goes, he goes, what you what you sell to yourself and what you buy is what you will project and what other people will buy from you. He goes, so stop telling yourself all the reasons why you can't win and start telling yourself all the reasons why you can't lose. And he goes, list off all the incredible things that you've got going for you. And he goes, and you start to believe it. And he goes, when you believe it, he goes, that's what you're going to project to other people. And he goes, and then other people will believe it and they'll buy it that you, that you're capable of this. And that little coaching session that he gave me on that chairlift, I, I went on to win two gold medals that March uh, in downhill slalom in the junior men's division in Garmisch, Germany. So the only thing that changed was what he said to me and the way I looked at it. And I was like, yeah, right. He's right. You know, what do I have to lose? You know, and all these different things. So anyway, I think there's like, I think be, learning how to 
to really deal with the overcoming the fear of rejection, really having like that self-confidence, you know, a sincere self-confidence and believing that you can do it, having a sales background and understanding the different steps of sales and how to basically sell other people on your dream or to convince them to help you along your journey on your way to your dream is important. And then from there, I just, I had developed these different steps and, and it starts off with visualization. So I visualized myself actually on set, filming a TV show. I could see the cameraman. I could see the sound guys. I could see a director going and action, you know, but I didn't know what I was doing, right? I didn't know what the show was about. But once I knew, once I knew that that's what I wanted, I have this theory. And this theory is, is that opportunities are all around us. They're, they're coming at you every single day. The thing is, I call it the yellow bug theory. And here's what, here's what that is. Let's just say, for example, you go buy yourself a brand new Volkswagen bug and it's and it's yellow, right? And you get out on the freeway and you're driving down the interstate and all of a sudden you're like, there's a yellow bug, there's a yellow bug. Wow, there's another yellow bug. Those yellow bugs were there every single day passing you on the freeway. The problem was is they meant nothing to you. You had no, there was no attachment to the meaning of those yellow bugs, but now you own one. So there they are. And that's how these, that's how goals and opportunities in life work. Once you once you can visualize and see what it is that you want, those opportunities have been passing you by every single day. So now you can just reach out and grab it. Well, in my case, I announced at my birthday party that I was going to have my own television show. Two days later, I did a charity auction. And after my charity auction, a guy came up to me who happened to be one of my clients because I was managing a newspaper at the time, the sales department. And he's like, Sean, I didn't know you did auctions. I'm like, he goes, I, he goes, I knew you did stand-up comedy. He goes, but I didn't know you did auctions. I go, yeah, yeah, I've been doing these for a while. I love raising money for nonprofits. He goes, dude, you should come do my storage auction. I go, a storage auction? What's that? Because there were no TV shows or anything about it. He goes, yeah, people don't pay their storage bills we can auction their stuff off i go what and he goes yeah he goes, when's your next one he goes tuesday i went tuesday i watched it and i thought this is my show like i'll be that i'll be that auctioneer right there doing these storage auctions I, I, at the time i was doing stand-up comedy and i used to do a lot of crowd work so i thought i'll, I'll pick on the crowd i'll give them nicknames i'll i'll pit people against each other i'll make it funny well you know i just had all these images of what it'd be like so I walked in the office and I convinced this guy's brother who owned the place to let me do their next storage auction. My wife and I uh, went and talked to the different people who were selling. We said, where do you guys sell this stuff? They go swap meets. So we, for the next five weekends, both Saturdays and Sundays for the next five weekends, we went to every swap meet in San Diego County, went up to every single person selling and said, do you want to join my email list? I've got a huge storage auction. Would you like to come? Yeah, I want to come. Got 2000 people to sign up on the day of my auction. The auction I went and watched, there were 26 people there. When we promoted my first auction, 800 people showed up. Wow. <laughs> it was insane. And I had a, and I had hired a cameraman who I'd met at one of my charity auctions. And I said to him, I said, dude, I'm going to try to create a TV show. Do you want to go in on it with me? He goes, nah, man, it's too hard to sell a TV show. He goes, but you, uh, you can hire me. And I said, how much? He goes, 1500 bucks. I said, okay, well, I made more than 1500 doing the auction. So I was able to pay him and I turned it into a TV show. And for years, that guy would call me up. He's like, dude, I should have taken your offer. <laughs> I should have, I should have produced the show with you. You know, like, yeah, you had your chance, but anyway, it was really, um, so, so I think those are the, those are kind of like those things. Like, like for me, it's like not having fear of rejection, having sincere confidence, having a sales background and and then and being able to spot opportunities knowing that they're all once you once once you know what it is you want then being able to spot those opportunities then taking action as quick as possible all of those things lead up to it and then um so that was that was really how I all got how I got started so all that the big big chunk of that action birthday party was like on a thursday charity auction like a couple of days later on a saturday the next Tuesday, I'm at the storage auction going, this is my show. And then I was off to the races. Nine months later, I was on TV. That is so amazing. It sounds yeah. like really stacking some of those quick wins in the beginning gave you the that momentum to go forward. But what really stands out to me is what you said about the first person you need to sell is yourself. Yes. You need to truly believe in what you're doing. And once you have that self-belief, other people can read that because we can all tell when someone is trying to be confident but they're actually insecure and yeah. that's the question i would love to ask next besides rejection proofing yourself which we'll come back to because i have some 
things I'm doing around that. How do you go about building your confidence and building that self-belief? Well, um, yeah, that, that's a good one. It's because, you know, a lot of people struggle with with self-confidence and a, a sincere self-confidence. Like sometimes people come off, they're trying to, they're trying to come across as being self-confident, but really it's this, this fake bravado that they're just doing, you know, uh, you know, and it's, it's like, come on, dude, calm down. That right. that sincere deep confidence um, usually comes from you know, if you have a track record of of some successes in life, that that obviously helps. But you know, I think that I think that that um, I think that the the coaching that 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 Olympic gold medalist gave me at such a young age made me realize that let's say that you don't initially have that self confidence. Let's just say that you don't necessarily you're thinking initially like. I have no idea how I would ever do this. It's so big. It's so crazy. How would I ever, I, I don't know. I, you know, you like immediately you have imposter syndrome, like, well, that, well, that, you know, I'm not qualified to do this. Right. But then I think that like what, what he was sharing with me, oh, his name was Billy the kid, by the way, Got Billy. It. Yeah. He went by Billy the kid. His n- real name was Bill Johnson and he won the Olympic gold uh, medal in downhill uh, racing uh, in Sarajevo when the Olympics were in Sarajevo. But Bill Johnson, um, uh, so anyway, he's the one that, that told me this. And, and you know, what his little theory was like, hey, stop saying like all these reasons why you can't. And then just start selling yourself, start listing out all the reasons why you can or why you can acquire the skills that will that will get you there. And that's the, that's the really important thing is um, if you, I think to get that sincere confidence is to basically realize, okay, listen. You just admit to yourself, yeah, I don't know all these things, but I have the capacity to learn and I have the capacity to take action quickly and I'm willing to fail. And I'm willing to, and that's the other thing is like, I, I don't see failure as failure, to be honest with you. I actually get an endorphin release in my brain when I fail because it's a learning experience. You know, it's funny that researchers have found that it's not getting the reward that actually releases the most endorphins in your brain. It's learning something new and it's the journey of getting there, right? So each time you each time you encounter a failure, you don't look at it as a failure. You look at it as a learning opportunity. And if you can learn something from it, then you're getting these natural endorphins released in your brain. It's like this reward center is going crazy, right? So if you're sitting here looking at yourself and you're saying, oh, I really don't have the confidence to do this right now. The way you need to look at it is like, okay, I really want to do this. It's going to be a journey to get there. There's a lot of different steps that I got to learn. There's so much that I got to learn that I don't even know yet. But, and I'm going to fail. I'm probably, I'm going to fail probably more than anyone else has ever failed at other things. But every single time when something goes wrong and I fail, I'm going to learn from it. I could tell you the, I could tell you the second part of that story. I'd like to show, share with you, uh, Gregory, how much I failed on my journey to get in that TV show. Is that cool? Yes, please. We love diving into the trenches on the yeah, podcast. So, like, tell us about what went wrong, all the things that didn't yes, work. And so, and, and so, And so when you come through the other side of all this is when you have that real sincere, solid confidence because you're like, I did it. Right. But going through it, everyone has fears and doubts and, you know, trying to like create, sell and start a TV show. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a manager. I didn't have any contacts. I've never been on an audition. I'd never, I didn't know how to sell a TV show. I, there was nothing, man. This was like 2011, you know, there was like, there wasn't even a lot of help out there. So so what I did was after I filmed that initial auction, um, I had it cut down to like a little three and a half minute reel. And I went over to the video guy's place. I watched it. I was like, wow, I was blown away. I was like, yes, this is a show. And so I called my boss. I was working at the San Diego Reader at the time. I was the business development manager. So I called my boss up and I said, hey, I got to take a few vacation days. He goes, yeah, no problem. So I sat, I sat down first thing in the morning. I Googled the names of every television network in America, not just the big ones, ABC, CBS, you know, uh, Fox, all that stuff, but then all the cable channels, you know, country music television, I, every, I got them all. And so I started with the biggest one, NBC, and I just cold called them. I'm like, hey, uh, my name's Sean Kelly. I need to speak with someone about a new TV show idea. And they're like, who are you? And I'm like, da, 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 da. And they're, yeah, it doesn't work like that. You can't just call in you know, click. And so then I called the next network, the next one, next one. I called every television network in America. They all hung up on me. Right. 
So then I went back to the beginning and I called NBC again and thought, okay, I've now been rejected by all, like I couldn't get through to anyone. So now I'm going to go back and see what I can learn. So I went back to the very beginning. This is all the same day, called NBC back. And I said, Hey, uh, listen, um, I just need to speak with someone about the, about the new television show idea. And they go, Oh, development. And I go, yeah, yeah. I need to speak with development. Okay. One moment, please. Boom. Put me. And I wrote down quickly on a piece of paper development. I'd never heard the word before. So I wrote development down. So then this lady's like, da, 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 and I go, I go, uh, may I ask who's calling? And I go, I go, I'll just let her know it's Sean. And she goes, Oh, okay. And she puts me through this lady gets on the phone with me and she goes, she goes, uh, da, 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 says, who, you know, and I go, I go, Hey, I go, I, I go, this is Sean Kelly. I said, I'm, I'm so happy to speak with you. I go, I just shot your next big television hit show. I've got it on a reel. I need to come in and show it to you. She goes, Whoa, 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 wait a minute. She goes, who is this? And I go, Sean Kelly. She goes, I don't know you, do I, Sean? And I go, no, you don't. She goes, but you got through all the gatekeepers. I said, I did. She goes, congratulations. She goes, but please don't tell me your idea. She goes, because legally I'm not allowed to listen to it. She goes, we might have something already in development and then it could result in a lawsuit, blah, 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 blah. She goes, but I love your tenacity. And she goes, it sounds like you're in your enthusiasm. It sounds like you might have a great idea. She goes, so you can't just call up development departments and speak to the head of development and just start pitching them your idea. It's you have to go through an agent. And I go, oh, okay, great. And she goes, yeah, so just get an agent and then have your agent call. And I go, okay, how do I do that? She goes, we'll just call up some of the agencies. I go, uh, what are they named? She goes, wow, you really don't know anything. She goes like WME, CAA. And she starts listing off all these agencies. I go, okay. So then I hang up and I start cold calling agencies. Uh, hello, who's the same thing, man. I get rejected by all the agencies. So then I go back and I Googled an agent's name at, at WME. And I said, yeah, may I speak with that? May I ask who's calling? Yeah, just let him know it's Sean. I get through the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper goes, uh, who's this? And I go, what's it about? And, then, and I'm like, da, 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 da. And, and then they're like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. They go, do you have any friends or anyone who's represented by WME? I go, no. And they go, you need to have a referral. You, they won't just talk to you. I go, but listen, I already spoke to the head of development at NBC. I go, she wants to hear my idea. I just need an agent. She goes, well, she goes, it doesn't work like that. And she goes, but... Uh, she goes, but I will tell you this. She goes, um, my boyfriend is trying to sell his own show and he's pitching to dr directly to production companies. I wrote production companies down. I didn't even know what a production company was. I wrote it down real quick. She goes, and they've got their own agents and you know, you pitch to them, they'll partner with you. They're the ones that make the TV shows. They'll pitch to the networks. And I go, oh, wow. I go, well, what, what's the name of some of the production companies? She goes, man, you don't know anything. You're green. And I go, yeah, I don't. She goes, well, so she lists off like three names. She goes, they're mostly in Santa Monica. So then I Googled all these production companies. I cold called all the production companies. They all basically said no. I couldn't get through to anyone. I didn't get anywhere with the production companies. One lady told me, she goes, you know, if you hire an entertainment attorney, they can introduce you to a production company. So then I cold call a bunch of entertainment attorneys. I couldn't get any of them to call me back. So at this point, I'm thinking to myself, how do you crack into Hollywood? I got this great idea. I got it in the can. I've spoken to every television network. I've tried to get through to every production company, all the agencies. So I took my little reel. I bought a domain name. I put it up on the internet and I said, here's your next great television hit show, right? Something like that. And with my contact information, I bought Google AdWords. I targeted them towards Santa Monica where all the production companies where I bought 80 search words and phrases that I thought someone looking for a new TV show might type into Google. I paid, you know, the pay-per-click. I bid it up to $25 per click because I figured I don't need a bunch of clicks, right? I just need someone to contact me. I got one click three weeks later, one phone call. This guy calls up and he's like, hey, is this Sean Kelly? And I go, yeah. And he goes, hey, man, I just saw your video. We think it might make a great TV show. I go, that's why I made it. He goes, do you want to meet up? I said, I'd love to meet up. He goes, well, I got to caution you. He goes, we're not a production company. We're a motion graphics company. He goes, we do motion graphics for television shows. He goes, but the owner of our company was at the dog park the other day, ran into a woman who owns her own production company, and she gave us an open door to come in and pitch ideas. We would like to, to pitch your ideas the first idea. What do you think? I go, works for me. And um, two weeks later, I'm in L.A., where I'm going in with these guys. We're pitching to this woman at this production company. She says, I love it. Uh, we do a deal, and then I wound up uh, being told that my show was going to be called Storage Wars. It was going to be on A&E. 
Then we got a call back from, from A&E and they said, oh, our sister channel, the History Channel already opted for a show just like this and it's moving to A&E. They're going to become Storage Wars. We're sorry, we're cutting the deal with you. So then I was like, oh man, I lost my deal. The lady said, don't panic. A couple of weeks later, I'm doing it with, uh, with True TV. They agreed to a pilot. The people who got hired to, to make the pilot had a completely different vision than what I had. They kept telling me like, oh, don't be this big energy guy. Don't be, don't quit joking around all this stuff. The stuff that made me me, right? The stuff right. that made- don't, don't be yourself. Don't be you. Don't be what got everybody's attention, right? So the pilot gets shot. True TV hates it. They come back and they go, what happened to the auctioneer? Why, why is he, why was he so- and then I went back to the production. I'm like, were you guys not talking to each other? I go, he kept telling me to, to down it. And then, so anyway, I, so they said, well, now the network doesn't want it. And I was like, what? So I thought, man, I, I just lost my big dream. I've lost it. So I went back to them and I said, look, I will refilm this for you guys completely for free. If you, you know, if we, you know, you don't have to pay me nothing. I'll just, I'll show up. I'll do the whole thing and just let me be me. So we did that. And then True TV loved it. They aired that pilot and it was the number one rated show in the history of the whole network. In wow. the first hour, it got millions of views. So uh, they immediately bought two seasons. And next thing you know, I'm on TV. And uh, so that, so, but it was a journey. It was a, even though I did it quickly in nine months, boom, boom, boom. I mean, there was a lot of getting punched in the face, a lot of like, a lot of rejection, you know? But the whole time, I just kept believing, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, you know. I have goosebumps and chills listening to this story. It is unbelievable. And there's a yeah. few things that stand out, Sean, that I want to talk about. The first is your ability to learn in real time quickly. Mm. Yeah. You're on the phone with the television companies in the beginning getting rejected, but learning new words that you need to say <laughs> maybe on the next call. Yes. And then you get to your the end of your list and you go back to the beginning and you tweak it slightly. And I love the fact that your tenacity in getting past the gatekeeper was what yeah. opened up the door. So it wasn't actually that you need to, needed to know anything. It was that you needed to not give up after getting rejected. Yes. Keep going. That's right. And yeah, you're absolutely right. It was just that, that tenacity to just keep going, just knowing that I was going to experience a ton of rejection. And I think that's where the, the sales background had really come in helpful because I had learned when I was selling it, selling over the years that you're, you know, trying to get past the gatekeeper and it's a difficult task. And then also, like you said, jotting down those words and learning that vocabulary on the fly and then incorporating that into the very next phone call, you know? Uh, and doing it with confidence. Um, and then the thing is, is like, sometimes I wish I could go back and give that woman at NBC a hug. And I wish I could mm. find that person at WME. And if you want to know what's crazy was after that, after I was living in the UK and starring on the British version, my, I actually wound up, my agent wound up being the head of non-scripted, all of non-scripted television for WME, the senior agent, Evo oh. Fisher. Uh, wound up being my agent, which was crazy. Like here I was getting like, I couldn't even get past the past the front desk and I barely got to a gatekeeper. And then later I wound up being represented by their biggest agent and non-scripted, which was really cool. I also wound up uh, getting the one of the biggest managers in the business. My manager, Larry Bresner, who sadly passed away from cancer, but he had been the manager for, um, for uh, Billy Crystal, Robin Williams, Steve Martin, Martin Short, Bette Midler. And Sean Kelly, <laughs> I was his only non-famous client, but, uh, but the couple of years that I spent with him were spectacular. So yeah, it, it was, it was crazy how it all, how it all unfolded. And what's coming up for me is that most people pick up the phone with a specific outcome in mind. I want to pitch my TV show, my dream, whatever it is to the channel. I want them to respond to me, but that usually doesn't happen, especially the first time around. And if that's your only goal for that phone call, and you get rejected, it's going to be hard to continue. But you kept going. And it was the words like development, production company, that that wasn't necessarily the outcome you were going for. But you were able to listen and learn and implement. And so when you go for something, you might not get the specified outcome, but you're going to get a little nugget, a little piece of wisdom, a key that unlocks the next door. And if That's you just right. keep going and keep going, the doors keep unlocking. And right. it leads you to a place that you couldn't have possibly imagined. I love how you said the unfolding. Life yeah. is so beautiful in how it unfolds. And I have found 
in my own life and I would love to ask in yours that when you have the courage to follow your dream, to say, this is what I want and I'm going to do it no matter what, that's when the magic really starts to happen. Yep. Yeah, you're right. And I had, I had chased other like career changes and aspirations when I was younger and had successfully made some leaps from, from one industry completely to another industry that was completely unknown to me. So I'd had some successes when I was younger. So I had other things that could have been like what I, you would describe as like a big dream at the time and, and had success in doing it. And so what's interesting is that um, once you, once you get some of these successes under your belt, um, you realize, oh, no, no, this is completely possible. Like, even if everyone thinks it's crazy, if everyone, because they think it's crazy because in their minds, they have no idea how they would ever do this, you know? And you, in your mind, you don't actually know how you're going to do it either, but you believe that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to go on the journey and you're going to basically learn. So in sales, I had learned over the years that like, um, you know, you can get rejected by, you know, by someone that you're trying to sell or a company or whatever, you can get rejected dozens of times, but doesn't mean that they're not going to buy from you eventually. And it doesn't, I mean, I, I had one guy who, who screamed at me so hard. And when I was selling advertising, when I was young and, uh, he came out of his office and he, and he pushed me and I fell backwards on the ground and it was a whole, whole thing. Right. And, uh, the, you know, and I'd been trying to sell his company for years and anyway, long story short, th that guy wound up becoming my biggest advertiser in the history of our publication. And he ended up having me come over to his house for dinner on multiple occasions. And he turned out to be a really nice guy, but I just never gave up because I knew that my product was right for, for his business. I knew that I knew it could really help him a lot. Um, and that's the other thing too, is you, 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 you have to, you have to believe you have to believe with all your heart. So, so um, when I initially told all my friends and family at my birthday party and everybody kind of laughed, the one person who didn't laugh was my wife. My wife said, listen, if it's a TV show you want, you're going to get it because she'd seen me do these other things in life where, where technically I should not have been qualified. I shouldn't have even been allowed to, in a lot of these spaces, I shouldn't have been allowed to even enter them because I didn't have the qualifications or the background, but was able to get myself in and then become hugely successful. And once you're a success, people, you know, what's so weird about it is like, you know, once I had my own television show, once I became an executive producer of the British one, the British version and the celebrity one. And then I created a television show for Nat Geo called Church Rescue, where we would, it was kind of like bar rescue, but we were fixing up churches. That was another show I created. Once you have a track record, people don't go, oh, hey, uh, where'd you go to college? Or, you know, what did, what did you, you know, what did, they don't care. All they care right. about is like, you're doing this and you're successful at it. So you just have to be willing to take like a bunch of rejection, but don't, don't view that rejection as rejection. That's the key. Cause if you view it as rejection, it's going to beat you down and you're going to get depressed or whatever. It's you, you have to realize it's not rejection. What it is, is it's a learning experience and you have to basically take the time to ask follow on questions, even after you've been rejected, you have to be able to, it's like, even when I would go and pitch television shows after that, like after I was a known producer and I would go to a production company to produce, to pitch a new idea that I had, if they said, nope, we're going to pass, I, I wouldn't just go, oh, okay. And pack up my stuff and leave. No, I have six or eight people from this production company. I'm, it's a focus group. Now I'm going to ask them why they're passing what it, what do you like about my idea? What what do you think's not going to work about my idea? What what would you change? And now I'm focus grouping these guys. I'm learning stuff. I'm getting an endorphin rush, you know. So it's not it's and then sometimes those situations turn themselves around because you're like you accept it and you go oh okay but let me ask you this and you you continue on and then it turns into a sale sometimes because they're like oh well I didn't know that you know. Yeah, that's so powerful. I feel like the learning comes in that last part of the cold call or the last part of the meeting where even if you got rejected, you are still asking questions so you can learn, so you can figure out what to do next time. And it reminds me of a book called Rejection Proof. Have you ever read it? I haven't read it, but I know who that author is. And I've seen him give, I believe it was a TED talk. Yeah. And, um, he, he sought out to go get rejected like you know, he was going to go get like a bunch of rejections, like a thousand rejections and then be, make himself rejection proof. And so I have seen his Ted talk. Um, 
you know, I, I could share with you my, how I'm able to overcome rejection. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this happened when I was 11 years old. This is a cool story. Um, so when I was, when I was 11 years old living in Germany, uh, my dad was a life insurance salesman. He was selling life insurance to American GI stationed in Germany. We weren't there. Uh, we were there as illegal aliens. We went to Germany on a three month visa and stayed for nine years or however long it was. So, uh, so basically my dad, uh, he was not allowed to go into the U S army housing areas and knock on doors to solicit life insurance. Right. But he needed to get leads. He needed he needed basically people that he could set appointments with to go try to sell them life insurance because that's how he made a living. So my dad, I used German school used to get out at one o'clock every day. So when I was like 10, 11 years old, my dad, I would jump in the car with my dad and drive into work and just hang out with my dad while I went to work because uh, my mom had a job. So I, he didn't want me sitting at home by myself. And we would listen to uh, Zig Ziglar in the car and we would listen to Zig Ziglar and all of his sales training. So as a kid, I'm constantly listening to the sales training and I was a fired up, you know, motivated kid. So my dad says to me, he goes, hey, listen, he goes, I'm not allowed to go into the housing areas to get lead cards filled out. He goes, but he goes, I was thinking maybe you could go in and you could knock on doors. You're a kid. You know, they're not going to do anything to you. And he goes, and if you for each lead card you get filled out, I'll pay you a dollar. And he goes, and then if they book an appointment and I sell them life insurance, I'll give you an extra twenty five dollar commission. And I'm like, mm, I don't think so. I don't I, it's not it's against the rules. I don't, I really don't want to do it, dad. And he's like, Oh, come on, come, you know? So he really pressured me into doing it. So he gives me a stack of lead cards. He drives me to the army housing, housing area. I could see it in my mind. Like it was yesterday. I'm 11 years old. He drops me off and he goes, okay, I'll meet you back here in two hours. Just go see how many cards you can get filled out. So I go knocking on doors and people start, they're like, what are you doing? This isn't allowed. They're yelling. What are you doing, kid? Get out of here. Close slamming doors in my face and everything. So a couple hours later, I meet my dad back where I was supposed to meet him. And he pulls up and he looks through the front windshield of the car. And he's got the biggest uh, look of disappointment on his face because he sees that I'm standing there just crying and sobbing. So he like motions me to get back in the car. And when my dad was upset with me, he'd always call me by my middle name. And so I'd get back in the car and he'd go, what's the problem, Brandon? <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, it was horrible. People yelled at me. They made me cry. He's like, ah. So we drove across the street to the army base and we went to the, to the burger, the burger bar where they sold hamburgers and sodas and stuff. And we sat down My dad bought me a hamburger and a soda and we're sitting there visiting. And my dad goes, Hey, he goes, Sean, he goes, did I ever tell you about this casino? He goes, uh, there's this casino that you can go to and you can, uh, he goes, you can place a bet. And if you, and if you don't win the bet, uh, you you don't lose any money. They don't take your money. He goes, but if you win the bet, they pay they pay out. And I go, no, that doesn't exist. He goes, no, no, no. It's like a real casino. You can go in there. He goes, you place your bet. They'll let you bet. He goes, but if you don't win, you know that your money. You can just re keep rebetting until you win. I go, dad, that doesn't exist. I go, because if that existed, then why wouldn't everybody do it? He goes, well, yeah. He goes, that's it's crazy. Why wouldn't everybody do it? And I go, yeah, it's crazy. And I go, that doesn't exist. He goes, son, he goes, I'm telling you it exists. And I go, okay. I go, he goes, well, do you want to go there sometime? And I go, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd love, let's go. You know, I'd love to go sometime. He goes, well, how about we go there now? I go right now, you're going to drive me to this casino. And he goes, do you want to win some money? And I go, yeah, of course I do. We get back in the car. We drive out the front gate of the army base across the street into the housing area and he goes, okay, get out of the car. He goes, there's the casino. And he's pointing at the house. And I go, what? I go, you're trying to trick me. I go, this isn't the casino. He goes, no, son, that's the casino. He goes, because listen, every time you knock on the door, you're placing a bet whether or not they're going to fill the card out. He goes, and if they don't, you don't lose any money. He goes, but if they do, you win a dollar. And he goes, and if they buy life insurance, you win another $25. He goes, so every time you place a bet, he goes, he goes, you're just betting. And he goes, but if you lose, he goes, you don't lose any money. And he goes, and here's the amazing thing about this casino. He goes, the better you get at what you're saying to people, the better chances you have at winning the bet. He goes, so you can increase your odds. And I go, oh, okay. So it's a casino. So I get out of the car, I go, I start knocking on doors. And um, so a couple hours later, my dad comes back. This time he looks through the front windshield of the car. He sees me smiling. I'm smiling. He waves me back in the car. He goes, so how did you do, son? And I said, well, I go, I won 27 bets. And I handed him 
27 lead cards. He goes, wow. He goes, how did you do it? And I said, well, I just told people because you would get a free brass plated social security card if you filled it out. And they would ask, it's, it, the headline said, nine out of 10 soldiers can get an immediate pay raise. If you'd like to find out how to get more money for college, investing, uh, you know, uh, life insurance, because that's what he sold, check, check one of these boxes. I said, well, I just started off by just saying that to the very first person, like everyone's going to be getting these free brass plated social security cards. So I assume you want to get one too. And the lady was like, yeah, I want one. And she filled it out. And I said, and then I went to her neighbor and I said, well, Sharon just got this. And I'm pretty sure. And then, and I said, I just used that through the whole building. My dad goes, oh, that's great. So I learned at this young age that, you know, that that's, that's life, right? The, you can eliminate the fear of rejection by realizing that, yeah, you're going to get rejected, but you're not going to lose anything as a result of it, right? You, jo you just keep placing these bets because eventually you're going to win. And then what I found out later in life that my, I know my dad didn't know, but I, I learned this myself, is that researchers had found that the reason why the fear of rejection is so powerful is that it's hardwired in our brains in the same portion of your brain where you feel physical pain. And it was during evolution, like if you go back to like when we were living in caves as cavemen and stuff, if you got kicked out of the village, like if you did something horrible in the village and they like kicked you out and you didn't have the, the community, you're not going to survive. You know, some wild animal is going to eat you and you're going to die. So basically mother nature realized, Hey, I got to hardwire this into this dumb dumb's brain in the same place where he feels pain so that he realizes never to push it too far because if he gets rejected, it's going to cost him his life. Right. Right. So that's why it's so such a powerful thing, that fear of rejection, because it's real. It's not made up. But the interesting thing is, is that over on the reward side of our brain, where the endorphins and everything are, is that it turns out that like having like having like a goal that you're going towards, you know, when you get that goal, you get endorphins released. Right. But as you're learning something new to help you along the way to that goal, more and more, more endorphins are released than actually obtaining the goal. That's why sometimes you obtain the goal and you, you don't maybe feel as good as you thought you were going to feel, but on the journey, you felt great getting there, right? So what all I've done was remove my fear of rejection from over here in the pain center of my brain, swooped it over to the reward center. So now when I go out and I experience rejection, I don't view it as rejection. This is my chance to learn and then get endorphins released. And I know it's just one more step on my journey. So now I just view everything I do in life as like just being in the casino, the casino where you can't lose any money. You can only win, you know, and it's, um, and I learned that lesson when I was 11 and it, and it was, and, and sometimes I feel like we get, we, we need to get prepared for things that are coming up in our life and whatever that life force is out there, God looking down on us, making sure that we have the tools that we need to survive. I learned that lesson at 11. So at 16, when I got abandoned by my parents, my dad took off with a girlfriend and moved to Berlin and my mom kind of took off with her boyfriend. And here I found myself living on my own at 16 had some real harsh rejection, you know, um, yeah. and trying to, I, I got a job driving a forklift at night. I rented a small apartment in the, in an attic in these people's house. And I stayed in high school and I finished school living on my own, paying my own bills, utilities, working a full-time job at night. But some of those lessons that I learned from Zig Ziglar and sales from hours of sitting in the car with my dad and then going on all those hundreds of sales calls with my dad at night, watching him sell people or knocking on all those doors and dealing with all that rejection, it, it somehow prepared me beyond my years. So it so here I was at 16 and found myself in this crazy predicament. But instead of melting down and just like, what am I going to do? I had this weird confidence. And the year before at 15 is when I had that chance meeting with Billy the Kid, who taught me that thing about, hey, stop telling yourself all the reasons why you can't do this and start selling yourself on all the reasons why you can, because what you buy is what you're going to project and what you project is what other people are going to buy from you. So I got these two extremely powerful lessons, three extremely powerful lessons right before I really needed them, right before I found myself living on my own at a young age. And a lot of young people might've turned to drugs, alcohol, gotten into trouble. But instead I, I took a path where 
my first job out of high school, uh, I worked down in Vicenza, Italy, catching shoplifters as an undercover store detective when I was uh, 18 years old, uh, down on an army base. And then that led me to enlisting in the army where I worked for US military intelligence, and I had a top secret clearance. And then I did a combat tour. And then after I came home from Iraq, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to go into sales. So I got into sales. And then all of that led me to where I am today. And I've had this amazing life because of this skill set that I learned. It's like every event and experience in life is preparing you for some future opportunity where you need that specific set of skills. Yeah. And you don't know it's coming, yeah. right? So, uh, listen to this. Right before I went to Iraq, to, I got to I got to Germany to my unit. And uh, it was my very first night. I'm, I'm sharing a room in the barracks with this uh, with this sergeant. And it was his last night in the unit. And he was getting ready to get out and go to college. He'd been there for four years. So I said, uh, I, you know, so we're sitting around, we're visiting. It's his last night. It's my first night. So I said, hey, Sarge, I go, you've been here for four years. You got any keys for me? I meant key advice, right? And he goes, oh, why did you say key? And I go, huh? And he goes, hold on. And he takes his dog tags off and he pops this key off of his dog tags. And he goes, take your dog tags off. So I took my dog, he goes, put this key on there. I put this key on. And he goes, he goes, okay, put that in your shirt. And I go, all right. I go, what's that key? He goes, well, he goes, listen, man. He goes, uh, he goes, if you ever find yourself in combat and he goes, and if your vehicle ever breaks down, he goes, a lot of people don't realize this. He goes, but all the trucks in the United States army are made by general motors and the same exact key, one key starts every vehicle in the U S army. He goes, he goes that way. If you ever lose the key, there's always the keys. The only way you secure your vehicle in the army is he goes uh, underneath your seat. You have a chain that comes up through the wheel steering wheel and you put a padlock on it. He goes, but they could always cut that lock. He goes, but it's always the same key that starts every vehicle. So I go, oh, okay, thanks, man. This is like 19, this is like 1989 or 1990. No, this was 19, this was July of 1990. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm never going to be in combat, but thanks, man. I grew up here in Germany because this was in Germany. Like I grew up here. It's safe. We're never going to, we're never going to be at war. That was July of, of 1990. Next month, August, 1990, Kuwait gets invaded. A few months later, I'm on the ground in Saudi Arabia. A few months after that, I'm in the invasion in a desert storm in Iraq. Second day of the invasion, my vehicle breaks down and they, a tow truck tries to come back to get us, but the unit had to keep moving. There's like shooting going on everywhere. It was crazy, man. We couldn't drive fast enough. The sun was going down. The tow truck couldn't drive us across the open desert quick enough in order with because we were holding on to the back of the truck bouncing you know and all of a sudden i see another army truck and i slam on the roof of the of the tow truck i'm like stop hold on and i jump off i run over to that truck i take that key off my dog chain i start the engine it fires right up my buddy jumps in me with me and we the tow truck just like us and that truck we just hauled across the desert as fast as we could and we caught up to my unit before the sun went down and it probably saved our lives but so like the crate, isn't that crazy? Like in life where I just said to that guy, you got any keys for me? I meant key advice. And he's like, yeah, dude, take this. And then the key ended up saving my life a few months later. So yeah, you just, you don't know what kind of lessons or what you're being prepared for, but if you have your eyes open, if you're willing to ask, you know, and you believe crazy, cool stuff can happen. Unbelievable. Unbelievable because we were talking about the metaphorical keys that you get in those conversations that unlock yeah. doors and now the actual literal key that saved your life yes. because you asked for it. Insane. Yeah. And you said something going back to the story about when you were 11 and rejection and all of this that really checked the box for me. It solidified something in my own understanding, which is going back to that book, Rejection Proof. He does 100 days of getting rejection. Yes. of getting rejected. And yes. I went on my own journey to get oh, rejected a cool. hundred times by asking strangers for outrageous things. Yeah. On day number four, I asked a stranger, I knocked on his door. I asked if I could jump in his swimming pool. He said, yes, I filmed yeah. it, put it on Instagram and it went viral. And then I ended up meeting a bunch of cool people. And I did 66 days out of that 100. And I haven't finished it yet because of two things you said. You said that you need a goal yeah. to be working toward to make the rejection worth it. And then you also mentioned learning, where if you can learn something from each rejection and apply it to getting better and moving you closer toward that goal, that that motivates you. And what I'm realizing is that 
I didn't necessarily have a goal beyond the, I want to do this a hundred times. Yeah. And because I was asking each stranger for something completely different, can I jump in your swimming pool? Can I cook you chili? Can I drive your car? Like all of these things, I wasn't necessarily learning things, or maybe I was learning them, but I wasn't applying them to get 1% better in the next one. Yes. So what I'm realizing is for myself to finish this challenge is get clear on the goal. Like, why am I doing this? Yes. And then figure out how to learn each, each time I do it, even if I get rejected, it's helping me in the next one. Yes, that's right. You know, like if you can, if you can kind of solidify your goal, maybe it just started off as this thing like, oh, I read this book. It sounds like he got, he gained a lot of benefit out of it. And I want to just go gain the same exact benefit, which is I want to become rejection proof. Yeah. So that might just be it. Or you might have a bigger goal. You might realize, Hey, you know what? I'm learning skills from this. Maybe I could channel these skills into something bigger. I like that a lot. So let me tell you one more story, which, uh, which is be because you brought that up. Please. Uh, when I was 19, I was stationed at Fort Devens right outside of Boston when I was in the army and I was going through some training there. We had a long weekend coming up. I was, uh, at the time I was only an E3, like a private, but there was an older sergeant. Uh, he was an E6 and usually E3s and E6, you don't talk to each other. It's fraternization, you know, but it was, but we were in a training unit and we were both going through the same training. So they kind of relaxed the rules a little bit. So this sergeant, I'll never forget his name. His name was Sergeant Suarez. He said to me, he goes, hey, he goes, uh, PFC Kelly, you know, so private first class Kelly. He goes, hey, hey, Kelly. He goes, you got any plans for the long weekend coming up? And it was a four day weekend. We we're going to have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday off. And I go, I go, no, man. I go, I don't have any friends or family out here. I go, I grew up in Germany. He goes, hey, man. He goes, do you want to play an entrepreneur game with me? Well, this was 1989. I was 19 years old and I had never heard the word entrepreneur. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what he was asking me. So I said, I said, um, you're going to have to explain to me what that means. He goes, well, he goes, it's a, it's kind of like a business game. He goes, here's the idea. He goes, Friday, he goes, Friday morning, we'll get up early, our first day off. And he goes, we'll leave the barracks with only our, our, our ID cards and our clothes, no money, no wallets, no, not just a, just a, like a driver's license uh, or our ID card and nothing else. And I go, okay. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, and then we'll go out and he goes, and we'll see how much uh, money we can make w starting with from zero. And I go, okay. I go, but how are we going to eat? He goes, yeah, now you're getting it. I go, no, 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 bro. How are we going to sleep? Where are we going to sleep? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, I think you're getting it now. I go, no, I don't, I don't think I am getting it. He goes, no, no, no. We're going to go out. We're going to hustle. We're going to see how we can start from zero. And, and we're, we can't eat anything and we can't sleep anywhere. We can't do anything unless we make money. I go, oh my goodness. I go, that sounds crazy. I go, okay, count me in, man. You know, count me in. This guy had been in special, was in special forces and he had this real confidence about him and he wanted to get out of the army and become an entrepreneur. So I thought, yeah, all right, I'm going to do this with this guy. So that Friday morning, we wake up, we get out of the barracks. The first idea that we had was in Massachusetts, where we were stationed, there was a 10 cents redemption for cans and bottles. So our idea was, let's go dumpster diving it, get on the army base and get cans and bottles. So we did. We collected a bunch. We cashed those in. Then we there was a guy in our unit that had like a VW van. So we hired him, paid him with the money we made to take us to more dumpsters and get more bottles and more cans. And while we're in the dumpsters, we found crazy stuff like someone had thrown away a whole collection of CDs, like music CDs, right? Like, like, like 60 of them. Someone had thrown away a bunch of army uniforms. So we got, grabbed all that stuff. So we took the army uniforms to the army Navy store off the base. We took the CDs to a used music store. We cashed all those in, cashed in the cans of bottles. We took that money. We bought a Polaroid camera and two train tickets into Boston. We went into Boston and our idea was to stand outside the Cheers bar. This is 1989. There's no cell phones. There's no nothing. People don't just have cameras. So we had a Polaroid and we were taking pictures of tourists standing in front of the Cheers bar and selling them five bucks. So for each picture, because people wanted that memento, right? So we stood there taking pictures. I'd run down to the drugstore, buy more, buy more film. We did this like all day long. Then that night I said, dude, let's get a hotel. He goes, no, man. He goes, we got to hold on to our money. We got to reinvest it. So we went to Dunkin' Donuts. We ordered a cup of coffee and we asked the lady, we're like, hey, you guys are open 24 hours. Can we sleep in this booth? We kind of told her what we were doing. She goes, I, I love it. She goes, yeah, you you guys bought your coffee. She goes, if, she goes it's going to be hard to sleep in that those hard plastic booths. But she goes, go ahead. So we got a couple hours of sleep. We wake up early the next morning. 
uh, get another cup of coffee. We open up the paper going through the classified ads, looking for a way to reinvest the money we just made. And we see this guy who has an entire storage unit of t-shirts that say, I heart Boston. And you have to come by the entire storage unit worth. He wants to blow them all out for a dollar a shirt. So we go over there and we had like, at this point, we had several hundred dollars we'd made from the day before. So we went over there and uh, I think we had like 600 bucks and we bought, so we bought 600 t-shirts and we went back, we went back to the outside the cheers bar. We sold Polaroids. We were selling t-shirts for five bucks and uh, we just hustled that. And we just did that all weekend long. Well, by the end of the weekend, uh, we had made $3,500. So $1,750 a piece at the end of the four day weekend after buying meals, after paying for train tickets, the, the, the Polaroid camera, like all everything, right. That was our net. We'd each made 1,750 bucks. And that was a life changing moment in my life because every step of that was an unknown. Every step of that was learning and building on top of what we just learned and finding something that worked and then repeating it, you know, and I look back in that moment and I, a, a fear that I'd had since I was 16 and living on my own had gone away. Because when I was 16, one of my big fears was how I was going to support myself and pay my bills and eat. And I was always kind of, you know, I was working, driving forklift and all this stuff. But once I was in the army, they take care of all of that. Like they give you uniforms, they give you food. You don't have to worry about anything. They give you a paycheck, right? So at, at this point in my life, I thought, am I going to have to make the military a career for the for my entire life because I want that sense of security because that's what had been kind of taken away from me as a kid, right? And, and the army gave me that sense of security. But all of a sudden through this one exercise, I realized, no, actually all I need is my health. If I'm healthy and I can get myself out there and I can hustle, I can I can make money starting from zero, starting from scratch. So that starting from zero experience I use that with every new project that I start. I re always remember like, hey, we didn't know how we were going to feed ourselves. And we just got going where it logically made sense. And it led us down this incredible path. And so with every new adventure that I start on, I always go back to that and realize, man, you can lose it all. But as long as you've got your health and you're not afraid to hustle and get out you're not afraid to go talk to strangers like what you're talking about like it takes guts to walk up to a stranger knock on his door and say hey can i go for a swim in your pool that is such a right? great story and it's so powerful i love the start from zero mentality and again i feel like we're reinforcing that lesson of don't be afraid to get rejected do the thing take what you learn from that rejection attempt implement it, iterate, try something new. Mm -hmm. And it's just this cycle that continues to build yep. on it. And the piece that is resonating with me the most that I'm yep. left with is you would have never been able to predict that you would be selling Polaroid pictures and t-shirts outside of the cheers bar. You only got there because you took the first step mm. and then the second step and then the third no. step. And then maybe that was step 27 after sleeping in yeah. a coffee shop. It's unbelievable what can happen if you're just willing to take that first step. Yeah, you know, and we could have like stopped at the Polaroid thing and said, oh, we'll just do this all weekend, right? But but he was like, hey, we gotta we gotta risk this money and reinvest it and try to find and, and try to add to it, you know? And and sometimes I used to think to myself, wow, if that guy, if he and I had spent 30 days doing that every single day for 30 days, we did that in four days. We we were at the thirty five hundred dollar mark in four days, where would we have, where would that have compounded and gone you know we could have i guess we could have lost it all or whatever but you know it didn't it it felt good and we were both and the thing was is we we were having a good time and that's another that's another thing is like this life is a this is a gift man like you know i would i learned i learned when i was in combat when i was 21 that like uh there were moments there where i could have something could have gone wrong and i would not be here today and so every day you got to realize that this is a this is an incredible gift that we're given this whole life and there's this gigantic canvas out there and you can go and do like if you if there's somewhere you want to go or something you want to do no one but you is stopping you 
You're the person that stepped. You might think, oh, well, I don't have the money or the resource. Get the money, get the resources, make it happen. Go do it. Set the goal. So you want to get there. You know, uh, I, I mentioned before, I've been to 93 countries. You know, I love to travel. I got the travel bug when I was a kid growing up in Germany because we would travel so much to all the little neighboring countries. France was two hours away. Austria was three hours away. Uh, Holland was two hours away. Poland was three hours away. So, you know, it's like it, these are these are road trips, you know. So yeah. I got by the travel bug early. And then that's when I like wrote, wrote out a bunch of extensive goals of like, Hey, here are all the places on planet earth. I want to go. And I didn't know how I was going to do it or how I was going to come up with the money, but I did it. And I think it's, I think, I think for your listeners that are out there, uh, they're, they just got to realize they're, they're sitting on all of everything that they want to make you know, come true is right here in their mind. They just, you just have to be able to dream it up and see it, then believe it. And then just have the the courage to go out and take the action and just know you're going to get rejected like crazy, but just, in, just enjoy it. Just like, you know what I mean? Just enjoy the rejection. Like, okay. You're going to be part of my story someday, bro. <laughs> you know, whoever's rejecting you, be like, ah, you'll be part of the story. You'll be part of the success story. <laughs> So good. So good. Your energy is infectious. It's contagious. Oh, I just got to come hang out with you for a little bit. Oh, thanks. Thank you. So well, I really appreciate this. One of the last questions I'll ask you, and maybe you can share it on the podcast. Maybe this is something that people have to come work with you to learn. But yep. what is that secret formula for reinventing yourself that you mentioned earlier that you had used multiple times throughout your life? Yeah. So, so my formula is basically, I have these like 15 steps. And of course, it's one of these things where I want people to come work with me and I'd like to take them through it. But I, but I can share the, the first few steps with you so you can kind of get a gist of what it's all about. Right. It, it, it does, it starts off with one, uh, of one you really defining what your what your big dream is. Like it's got to be big and audacious. It's got to be life changing. It's got to be something where like, like with me, I was, working at the newspaper in San Diego, the reader, I was working at the, at the San Diego reader selling advertising or in charge of the advertising department. And I went from that world to being on television and then being in an international television star and then producing television. It's a, that's a big gigantic leap. You know, I went from where, um, you know, nobody knew who I was to where when I was living in the UK, my show in the UK was the number one show on, on what they call Freeview. So if you don't have cable, most of people in the UK don't have cable. They have what they call Freeview. My show was the number one rated top watch show on Freeview. So I used to go to these um, comic cons and I would meet all the fans and they would line up and wait two, three hours to meet me, which is insane. And I, you know, they would want my autograph and take a picture with me. And they just wanted to buy something from me, a t-shirt or something, you know, just something. Oh, I got this when I was with Sean, you know, I want to support Sean Kelly. Right. So, um, so you have to have a, a big, gigantic, audacious dream like that. And then you have to like, really ask yourself, is this really what I want? Like, am I really willing to put in the work and the hard work? Cause it's going to be hard. There's going to be a lot of rejection and there's going to be a lot of moments where you, where you might even doubt yourself or where it's just, or you're just like, okay, now why am I doing this? Cause I could be doing all these other things that are so much easier. Right? So first of all, you have to really settle on your dream. And then once you settle on it, then you have to give yourself some quiet time to really visualize yourself and see yourself in the dream doing what it is you want to be doing. So I told you before, I actually saw a cameraman, soundman, I saw people on set and I heard someone go and action and I flew into action before the show idea. What was so crazy about this was that in July of 2014, so all of this happened back in 2010. And I got the pilot 2011. 2014 is when I filmed the very first episode in the UK of Storage Hunters UK. We were in East London, down in Docklands, right on the river where they have a bunch of like storage stuff. And it was a, it was a, it was a, we started filming at like 10 o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning, something like that. It was a drizzly London day. It's raining. There's, there's three cameramen on me. There's sound guys out there. There's producers running around. There's about a hundred people on set and this little director, his name's Sean Doherty, British guy, just lovely. I made all my seasons of the TV show with him, but this was the first day and I'm standing there. And my dad had recently passed away and I was standing there thinking, gosh, I wish my dad could have lived to have seen this. And then all of a sudden I hear Sean Doherty go, and action, mate. And it was just my dream coming true. Just 
rushing, just like, even though I'd already made the American one, this one held so much more purpose because here I'd gone international and, and it was, it was literally what I had visualized all those years later, that one moment right there. So you have to visualize it. You have to believe it. You have to write it down. You have to become very clear about it. And then you have to have the guts to tell your friends and family that you're going to do it. Then you have to be prepared for a lot of laughter and rejection and a lot of questions that you're not prepared to answer yet. And then you got to start finding the answers and you got to use these, these tools, like the thing about those opportunities that are coming at you, because once you realize, okay, now I can visualize, it, I can see it. Then, then I just got to find that opportunity and I got to grab it. And, and you got to take a lot of action quickly. So that's kind of how it all starts. And then, and then basically the rest of my formula takes you through the, the whole the whole thing, you know. So if there's anyone that, you know, any of your listeners that that want to uh do that, they're more than welcome to come join my Facebook group for free, which is the big dream. Um, or they can go to my website, which will lead them there, which is do the big dream.com. But I also feel like what you're doing for people is extremely valuable. And that is, you know, you're offering coaching. And some of the biggest accomplishments I made in my life is when I wanted to make a leap into a field that I knew nothing about, and I was able to find a coach. Turns out that trying to create and sell and star on your own TV show back then, I couldn't find a coach for that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty small club that I'm in, right? But there was other things that I wanted to do. Like when I wanted to become an auctioneer, um, I... I went and did a, a did an auction without any training and I got I got paid a pretty decent amount of money it was a it was a it was a fundraising auction and I actually filled in for a friend who was sick and he said dude can you please cover? I'm a, I'm not an auctioneer he's like he goes just go on to YouTube watch an auctioneer he goes you're great at making stuff up just he goes dude he goes he goes these it's a it's the cancer society it's the American Cancer Society the auction is in La Jolla at the Hilton at Torrey Pines. There's going to be 800 people there. I don't want to let them down. I can't find a fill-in because I'm too sick to go. Please do this for me. So I went, I did it, and I raised a record amount of money for them that night. And uh, I thought, I didn't know if I did a good job, a bad job. I didn't know what I was doing. The lady came up to me. She goes, can we book you for next year? And this was my buddy's gig, right? And so they paid me 3,500 bucks to do that, that one night, and I'd had no experience. So I get this check. My wife goes, you should reinvest that. Go find the best auctioneer in America and just sign that check over to him to give you however much one-on-one -on -one training he'll give you. So I found this guy, Jim. He'd won the national bid calling championships nine years in a row. The reason why he didn't win at the 10th year is because he just didn't enter. He's, What's the point, right? I called this guy up. He lives in Bakersfield, California. I told him my story and I said, I got 3,500 bucks. He goes, ah, he goes, I'll tell you what, you drive up here, stay in a hotel. He goes, um, you know, buy me a couple meals. He goes, I'll spend like, you know, two day, two 10 hour days with you. I said, okay. I go, when can I come? He goes, how's tomorrow? I go, I'm there. And I got in my car, drove to Bakersfield. I gave this guy 3,500. And after two days, he liked me so much. He gave me another two, two days. So I spent four 10 hour days one-on-one -on -one with him teaching me how to bid call. You start off real slow. I'm bid it. I'm bid one dollar bidder now, two now, two now, two dollar bidder now, three now, three now, three. Or you could do different increments. Yeah, a dollar, dollar twenty five, one fifty, one seventy five, two. And then you start to you learn all the different increments, all the different. And then you gotta, then you gotta learn the rhythm and the speed. Like, <clears throat> I'm talking about a hundred dollars. I'm a hundred dollars. I'm gonna take it before. Four, 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 five, five hundred. I'm gonna six hundred. Seven hundred. Eight. Eight hundred. I'm gonna nine. I'm gonna thousand dollars. I'm gonna fifteen. I'm gonna twelve. Twenty dollars. Thirty five hundred dollars. Thirty five hundred. Four. Forty five hundred. Five. Five thousand. Right. So. You only like you only get better and faster with practice, and that takes a long time. But the best investment I made was signing that first check over to that guy because then immediately I was able to start charging, you know, like 5k for what I do. And the awesome part of that story, since I went and got that training all these years later, I've now raised over 500 million for nonprofits, children's hospitals, schools. Uh, I mean, you name it. I mean, I've I've had nights where we've raised five million in one night for like a hospital uh, in San Diego that was buying robots to do robotic surgery. Uh, these are the you learn. These are the generous donors that are in the room, and you're just the conduit that makes the 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 emotional connection with them, with hearts and minds, and you just help 
you just help these miracles. They just pass through you. It's these incredible donors, this incredible purpose, and you get to be the conduit where all this amazing stuff passes through. But I push a little harder than most auctioneers do because, because I, uh, one, I always believe in the cause that I'm raising money for. And a lot of times it's for sick kids and I love it. And then number two, I just know I see miracles happen like at all of these events and I know what's possible. So I push a little bit harder than probably most auctioneers do, but that was paying that guy. And then there's been other times when I've hired other experts to help me out along my journey. And um, one time I wanted to do my, I did stand up comedy for 20 years. And the last stand up comedy tour that I was going to do was in 2017. I had arranged to do a 122 city stand up comedy tour across the UK, starting with, 50 shows at the Fringe Festival in Scotland. I was going to do produce two shows a day. I was going to be on two shows every day for 25 days in a row, do those 50, and then go out and, and use that to launch my nationwide tour. And I did that in 2017. I did the 50 Fringe shows and then the 122 cities. It was insane. But wow. I realized that in order to do that, my material had to really resonate with the British audience. And the act that I had had for the US was different than what I was doing, you know, for the UK. Um, and I needed, I just needed new material. And so um, I hired the head writer from the Tonight Show, uh, John Max. John had worked for uh, the Tonight Show for 30 years, I think it was. He was Jay Leno's head writer. Um, and so uh, my manager, Larry Bresner, introduced me to John and I paid John a substantial amount of money uh, to sit down with my wife and I every single week, he would come to my place in Pasadena and we'd sit down for several hours and work out all this new material. And um, that was the material that I took and I toured and I did all those shows in the UK with. And without John, it would have never been possible. So because to try to develop a whole, because I needed 90 minutes of new material because of the comedy in the U.S., we do one-hour stand-up comedy. That's what a headliner does, one hour. In the U UK, they expect you to do 90 minutes. Um, and so, uh, so I needed 90 minutes of new material and I wouldn't have been able to do it without him. So I think like what you're doing, Gregory, like offering people that coaching and taking them through their experience that they want to go through. And I think like what I'm doing with trying to help people, you know, tackle that one big dream that they have, I think it's good to go after and find someone that's done it and has the tool belt and, and they can go, Oh, you just do this, just do that. And it just, it opens doors so much faster and the learning curve is so much faster and results are so much faster. Sean, you are one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. And I'm oh, good. so good. grateful that our paths have crossed. I'm excited yeah, to see too. what what doors are unlocked from this conversation, both in our own lives and in everyone who's listening. And it sounds like people can go to do the big to right. find out more about you, to join your Facebook group. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so no, grateful thank for this you. conversation. Gregory, I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for being so generous with your time and for uh, sharing this time with your listeners. That's awesome. And thank you to everyone tuning in with us today. We love you guys. Bye.